Okay, well, I want to uh, talk a little bit about our, our lab first. Oh, let me turn my mic back on. Okay, so this is the, uh, <clears throat> the lab for this week. Um, it's a bit of a longer lab, and it's going to be worth uh, 20 points. So your homework this week is very short. You just have one, two, three, five problems. Um, and it, and it just covers the, uh, what am I, what am I trying to like? confidence intervals that we just covered today. Okay, um, I, I do have this page that says about the midterm, and it lists off um, some exercises and uh, topics that you should know. Um, and again, make sure you bring your reference tables and a calculator. Um, okay, but going back to uh, lab two, you're going to uh, click uh, click these links, and you're going to download these PDFs, okay? And when you open them, these are the, uh, the PDFs here, okay? So this is uh, <coughs> these are coming from OpenIntro.org, um, which is a, a textbook company or textbook. It's a free statistics textbook, and um, sorry, you guys didn't get to use the free statistics textbook. <laughs> This uh, this quarter, but I'm, I'm trying to I'm I'm trying to get my convince the department to let me uh, use the, this textbook. Um, well, I don't know, so future students can save some money. But but anyway, I think I think this textbook is good. Okay, not not to knock anything about this. But anyway, here's um, here are the this is the lab. You're going to um, basically follow these directions, and what what we're looking at is we're looking at um, real estate data from the city of Ames, Iowa. I don't, I don't know anything about Ames, Iowa. They're the, this real estate data. And we're looking at um, just different properties of the houses that are, have been sold and things that exist in this real estate data. There, there's a lot in there, okay? And you're going to um, type in these commands, okay? So you're gonna, when you go to uh, our studio, you're going to type in the command, you know, download file, dot file, and uh, and you type in that web address and everything like that. I've, ar I've already downloaded the file, so I'm not going to do it again. But just type this command as you see it exactly right here. I recommend typing it rather than copying and pasting, because sometimes when you copy and paste from a PDF, it copies these invisible characters, and it messes up. Like, you'll paste it, and it looks OK. But then when you try to run it, it like gives you an error. Okay. So I know it's like a bit of a it's annoying to have to like type out full commands and things like that, but I recommend that because sometimes copying and pasting isn't going to work, and it's going to look like it's okay, but there might be an invisible character somewhere in there that messes you up. Okay, so I've actually um, I've done this, and then you're going to uh, load the file. Okay, and you're just going to uh, um, click this load aims dot our data. Okay, and if you run into problems, you can just um, Navigate in your um, uh, file browser over here, and then you can just click names to R data, and it's going to ask, "Do you want to load it?" And then that loads the R data right there. Okay. And when you do that, you should see that. Okay, now you have a data set that says 2,930 observations, and you can click and view it. Uh, okay. Um, and it says it's too large for me to try to do this, so it's, it's erroring. I'm on there, but um, but anyway, you can um, you can start to uh, to run these commands. So I've already uh, typed in all the commands that we're going to be using, okay? And so essentially, we're going to extract this thing that I think it means a ground living area, okay? So it's basically how much space. You know, when you say how big is your house, and they say it's 2,000 square feet, that's ground living area. That's uh, categorized in here, okay? Because this is real estate data. And, uh, and we can look at area, and now this is uh, an integer vector. Uh, and if I ask it to see area, okay, we can see, uh, you know, the listing of all houses. So the last house had 2,000 square feet, you know, here's a house with only 729 square feet, or 480. You can see a you can see a listing of all 2,000 
homes and their, their square footage here. Okay, now we can create a histogram of this as well. Oops, that's not what I want to do. So histogram, this is uh, the histogram of the, uh, the plot of the living area. And so we see it's, uh, it's very much right skewed in that we have some houses that are very big. Not very many houses that are this big, but a few houses very big. Most of the houses are between 1,000 and 2,000 square feet. You know, some smaller than that, some really small, um, and things of that nature. Okay. All right, and so what, what this lab is doing is it's um, going to create sampling distributions. So what I did last week to demonstrate how we build up sampling distributions, you guys are going to do this week. Okay, So we can see our population is right skewed. But what we're going to do is we're going to take samples of size 50. Okay. So, well, maybe just to, let me just talk a little bit about the RStudio interface. I didn't get to do this the, um, the first week because I forgot to bring the computer and things like that. So, what I often recommend, rather than typing code directly into the console, which I imagine many of you did. Um, so, when you start up RStudio, I think it looks something where the console is the main thing. What you can do is you can create something called a source File. Okay, so you go up here. Oh, can you see that? Um, and you click uh, New R Script, and it, it brings out a blank, uh, basically a blank document. Okay, and you can type code in here. So you can say like two plus five. Okay, and, and everything you write here doesn't get run until you um, you highlight that code and you click Run. Okay, and then it copies that down there and it says Set. It. And so, um, so what I want to do is I want to run this code that says sample one, sample area 50. So again, area is that uh, vector with 2,930 um, listing uh, numbers in it. And I'm going to um, have R take a sample of 50 points out of that 2,930. Okay. And so it didn't seem like it did anything, but we can see that under values here, it created a sample, SAMP1, and we can see that there's 50 values, and these are some of the values listed off in there. Okay. And so as you um, follow the uh, directions in the lab, it tells you, okay, well then um, the next thing that we want to do is, uh, okay, describe the distribution of the sample. So you know, you're going to have to do things like make a histogram of the sample, uh, SAMP1, See, okay, well, this is this is what the uh, histogram of the sample. Is. So the histogram of the sample is also right skewed, um, and things like that. You can ask for the mean of SAMP one and standard deviation of SAMP one, things like that, and get get these things to describe the distribution of the sample. Okay, okay. So actually, it says so it says to calculate the mean of SAMP one, which I just did. Okay, and so again, we are um, Making sampling distributions. So this is this is my y bar of sample one. Okay, and it says, all right. What we want to do, it, and it tells you, take a second sample, also size fifty, and call it sample two. And how does that compare? So basically, you're going to just run this same instruction again, except you're going to call it sample two. You're going to run that, and then you can ask for the mean of sample two. <clears throat> Uh, and run that. And you can see, okay, the mean of sample two was different, 1458 versus 1469, things like that. Are you guys able to uh, view what I'm doing on the screen here? It's legible. Okay, I hope so. Okay, so anyway, it says you want to do this a whole bunch of times. It's actually going to have you do this 5,000 times, and it's going to create, um, it runs this loop here. Okay, and I've already typed that in here so we don't have to uh, uh, do this. So I'm going to just uh, run this. Okay, so uh, it ran the loop 5,000 times. And uh, we can ask to create the uh, a histogram of the uh, 5,000 sample means that we, uh, we did. Okay, and so here we go. This is what it looks like. Okay, and we can see now that we are looking at samples of size 50, even though our population was skewed right, when we look at the sampling distribution, it looks a lot more um, symmetric and normal. And, uh, and it says, well, add some breaks to make the, the plot a little bit prettier. And it looks like that. Okay. 
All right, so anyway, you're going to uh, be doing this in your, uh, in your lab, and it asks you, you know, try doing some other things, okay? So careful things to, to watch out for, okay? Make sure your spelling and the numbers that you're typing in are all um, exactly as they should be uh, when you're retyping your code. I think that will help avoid a lot of the problems that um, students run into. And, um, and it asks, you know, what would, you, what would happen if we collected 50,000 samples rather than 5,000? And you can easily change that by just sticking in a 50,000 here, okay? And so what we're doing is we're, when it says 50,000, you're not changing how, the size of your sample, you're changing um, how many times you're taking a sample, okay? It, it describes the for loop and exactly what it's doing there. Um, I wouldn't sweat that too much, too much, okay? Um, and, uh, and then it has you um, do the same, taking samples of size 10 versus samples of size 100, okay? All right. There is this command here, okay, that I want to highlight. And it says par mf row c3 comma 1, okay? Par is parameters for the graphics engine, okay? So when it creates these histograms and things like that, um, you're changing the parameters. And what this does is it says, don't give, normal, it defaults to just giving you one plot at a time. When you do par 3 comma 1, or mf row equals 3 comma 1, what you're saying is, I want to see three plots stacked on top of each other, okay? And so this is going to change the, um, the rules of, the, um, of your plotting, okay? So once you do this, every time it runs a histogram, it's going to put three histograms stacked on top of each other, okay? After you're done with this, you're probably going to want to reset that, and you would have to type in the command, um, basically, par mf row 1 comma 1, okay? It's, it's in a footnote at the bottom of the lab, okay? But uh, basically, take, pay attention to that footnote, because at, after you're done doing the three plots, you might be like, why does my plot only take up the top third of the window? The reason why is because you've changed the parameters of the, uh, the graphics engine, okay? So basically, so in the code that I ran earlier right here, I did samples of size 10 5,000 times and samples of size 100 5,000 times. And now I'm just plotting those histograms, okay? And you can see that it indeed plots all three histograms together. So let me, um, uh, let me just expand that, okay? And um, also, if you follow the code uh, written as it is, what it does is it also forces all three histograms to have the same scaling axis. And so we could see that changing the size of the sample decreases the spread of the sampling distribution. So uh, that's essentially what you're going to do in that lab. In the on your own section, which is um, what you also do is uh, you're going to be dealing with the price vector or um, data on price rather than area. Okay, so we looked at houses and we saw area was right skewed. You'll also look at the pricing. Okay, so some houses cost a lot, some houses cost a little. And you'll do something similar, creating sampling distribution based on um, the variable price. Okay. Now, once you complete that, Part two of the lab, or lab 4B, is you're going to make uh, confidence intervals, okay? Um, if you're doing it in one sitting, you don't have to redo this download and load things, okay? That's, that's all already going to be there. Again, I copied the, um, the code. And so don't forget to reset your graphing parameters to par mf row 1 comma 1. And so now I'm going to create a new population, okay? Again, this is... Um, we're still using the, um, the area of the houses, and I'm going to take a sample from that, and, uh, and we can look at the, the mean of the sample, okay? So basically, I'm doing something very similar, except in the next part of the code, uh, and I'm going to just skip over uh, stuff going on here. We're going to create boundaries of our confidence interval. I want to point out that in our uh, in this lab, it kind of it cheats a little bit, and it doesn't use T star. Okay, so 
the true confidence interval should use T-star from the T-distribution, where you take into account the fact that you're estimating the standard error, or the, uh, yeah, you're estimating the standard deviation of the population by using the standard deviation of your sample. Our, this lab here cheats a little bit and it just uses 1.96, okay? That's technically not correct, all right? But it's good enough for the purposes of the lab, okay? And it, it, it uh, allows us to avoid coding in some, uh, some extra rules, which wouldn't be too hard, but would probably make the lab more complicated than it needs to be, because you, you would have to add code to tell R how to look up the appropriate um, distribution. So we're just going to say use 1.96. It's good enough for us and we're going to do that. Okay, so we're going to uh, run that. We're taking samples um, in our code. We're taking samples of size 60 and so our um, upper and lower confidence intervals. Um, these are the bounds of our confidence interval. 1355 and 1568 based on um, our sample, okay? And uh, we didn't um, actually show what sample mean was, but uh, the mean of our sample was actually only 14, was 1459, okay? And so the question is, is that similar to the mean of the population? I'm typing in the wrong <coughs> spot. The mean of the population, on the other hand, So the mean of the population is 1499.69, okay? So the average square footage was around 1500 square feet. When we took a sample, we got a mean of 1459. And so when we create our confidence interval, our confidence interval went from 1355 to 1564. So was the mean of our population contained in our confidence interval? In this case, yes it was. 1499 is in between the lower and upper bounds of our confidence interval, so that's a good thing. Okay, let's try this 50 times. Okay, we're going to create 50 times, uh, I'm sorry, a confidence interval 50 times, and we're going to see what happens here. Okay, so I'm going to uh, run all of this code. Basically, it's just saying do the same thing over uh, 50 times, calculate the mean of a sample, calculate the standard deviation of the sample, and create a confidence interval. So 1.96 corresponds to a 95% confidence interval if we had uh, infinity degrees of freedom, okay? And uh, let me see here. So we're going to plot the results of this. Okay. So with a 95% confidence interval and, a, uh, and 50 different confidence intervals, we should miss about two and a half times. And, uh, and what we see is that these are all different confidence intervals. This dot indicates this is one sample where the mean of the sample was right here. I, I don't know exactly. There's no scale on this. OK, well, that's probably a deficiency in the code. But there's no scale here. But you can see this is the, uh, the confidence interval that it created. Okay, And we can see that for a lot of these, this one, the mean was down here, and it created a confidence interval, but it still managed to capture the true value of 1499, okay? So it barely made it, but that's good, okay? Um, because it would say, you know, I'm 95% confidence that the uh, mean square footage of the houses in Ames, Iowa is between, you know, whatever, 1300 and maybe 1502, okay? Where the true value is 1499.7. This one over here, for whatever reason, you know, you took a random sample and it ended up too small, it gives you this confidence interval, okay? And that one over there, the random sample had to ha happen to have a mean that was too large, and so it missed it, okay? And so, so here you get an idea of when we have a 95% confidence interval, basically you're creating just one of these confidence intervals. You have no idea which one you have. You have no idea if you have one that is really big, one that's really small, one that's small and missed the true population mean, okay, you have no idea which one you get. That's just the nature of random sampling. Okay. And so that's basically what you're going to be doing in this lab. You're going to, uh, you're going to run through it and, uh, and answer the questions. They have questions corresponding to these things, okay.
and uh, you know it'll it'll take a, a little bit of time to uh, to work through. Okay, I know I I ran through uh, a lot of these things uh, very quickly. Um, when you do your lab, what I would want you to do is um, start a you know a word document here, and then you know answer these questions uh, using you know sentences, and then when you um, when you look at, uh, you can include plots. A lot of times you can copy your plot to the clipboard, or you can save it as an image, okay? And so if you copy it to the clipboard, you can um, resize this and such. Okay, and then you say, uh, right click to uh, copy to the clipboard. I actually, oh, I right click on this thing. I think, uh, oh yeah, okay, and you do copy image. And then you uh, you paste. No, I paste. Yeah. And of course, it doesn't uh, doesn't work. Let's see. Copy image. Paste. Okay. So of course, for the demo, it's, it's not working here. Uh, well, in that case, I would have to do save image, and then you can save it, and then you can insert an image into your uh, into a Word document. Well, try the copy and paste. Uh, that's usually easier to deal with. But saving is also not bad because uh, then you can always recover things if something bad happened to your Word document or something. Okay, and then uh, you would answer the uh, the appropriate questions. Are there any questions on this? Is this okay? All right. Okay, then um, I suppose we can. Uh, well, we'll transition into uh, into review here, then. Okay, and maybe I'll uh, I'll try using this tablet to uh, to teach. And uh, if you hate it, we can go back to the chalkboard. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this. Okay, so. Um, to review. Are there questions from the quiz that you wanted me to review and go over in, uh, in its entirety? Question three? Okay, so question three. All right, let me, uh, let me pull up the quiz here. So it says, uh, question three says, if 10 people are randomly selected, what is the probability that you have at most one left-handed person? Okay, so here, this is a, it's a binomial problem. Oops. I'm, uh, still getting used to this. Okay, and so in this case, we have n equal to 10, and we're looking at at most one. So in that case, we have y equal to 0 or 1, okay? And it says approximately 15% of the population is left-handed, so we have p equal to 0.15. Is this legible and is this working out? Okay, so for this, we want to do 10 choose 0, 0.15 raised to the 0, and point, uh or 1 minus 0.15, or 0.85, raised to the, uh, not 9, but 10, okay? There's that eraser function, actually. <laughs> Still, uh, you this, okay? And then, um, and then you have 10 choose 1, 0.15 raised to the 1 times 0.85 raised to the 9, okay? And so to punch this into your calculator, let me, um, which to line I L in one, two. Okay, so you do ten choose the zero times point one five uh, raised to the zero. Okay, so that's those are both one times one. So it's, it's kind of silly that we're I'm 
type this out, but then you do 1 minus 0.15 raised to the 10. Okay, so that's the, uh, the first part, and you would get 0.19687. Okay, yeah, so that's that's the first part, and I, I haven't done the 10 choose one. Oh, okay. Okay? okay. So you, you can do it all in uh, one go with a, if you have a decent calculator. Okay, this is just a standard Casio Scientific. And then you can do 10 choose one. Okay? Is it, is it? I don't know. I don't know. So it, I mean, 10 choose one is 10, but you can just do 10 choose one. Um, so, 10 choose 1 times, okay, and you do 0.15 raised to the 1 times uh, 0.85 raised to the 9, okay. You compute that out and you get 0.347. Okay, and then now you can add the other number, 0.19687, or whatever. I'll just do 0.1969, and then so my answer ends up being uh, 0.5443. Yes? problem that said at least one, you have to do... Yeah, if it said at least one, okay, then that would be a huge pain in the butt. So at least one would be one, two, three, all the way up to ten. Okay, so you'd have ten numbers to calculate, uh, and you would want to avoid that. Okay, to answer this um, with uh, with R, we would do p by no one ten comma point one five. Okay, or you could do d by no uh, zero. 10 comma 0.15 plus a d by no 110 comma 0.15. Right? And I can actually uh, do that right here. Let me move this to the other side for those of you who are still copying. Okay, and we can we can see uh, p by no 110 comma 0.15. Is 0.5442 or 0.5429, so pretty much exactly the same what we got there. And uh, if I do d by no uh, 0, 10, comma 0.15, we get the first number that we got uh, and one, and then so I can add those two together. Okay. So we have that right there. I was doing like size equals 10 and then prob equals 0.15, so it's not even necessary. Oh yes, okay, so yeah, you could you could do d by no, d by no, 1 comma, size equals 10, prob equals 0.15, okay? Uh, when you look up the help on d by no, what you'll see, okay, if I, uh, You see right here it says d binom x size comma prop. Okay, so it's expecting the answers, the numbers in d binom to come in this order. And if you provide them in that order, um, it will work just fine. Okay, so you could do d binom ten comma point one five, and it works. Um, if you forget, if you're not sure what order it goes in. You could do d binom, and if you say prob is equal to 0.15 and size is equal to 10, you can change the order and it will give you the same answer. Okay, but if you do d binom and you change this to 0.15 comma 10, it's going to error out. It's going to say I have no idea what you're talking about because you're giving me a decimal number when I'm expecting uh, a whole number here. Okay, so if you provide the numbers in the order that it expects. As written out in the help file, it'll work without having to say size is equal to this and prob is equal to that. If you don't, if you put prob and size, whatever, you can change the order 
of the, uh, of the things you're saying. Okay. All right, so that was um, part one of number three. Um, maybe I should have saved that. And then part two says if 100 people are randomly selected, okay, what is the probability that you have at most 10 left-handed people? Okay. So in this case, it says use the normal approximation and continuity correction. Okay. So here we're going to use mu is equal to n times p, and sigma is equal to the square root of n times p times 1 minus p. All right. So in this case, n times p is going to be 100 times 0.15. So we have that equal to 15. And here I've got the square root of 100 times 0.15 times 0.85. And that's going to give me something else. So let's see. 100 times 0.15 times 0.85. OK, and then I'm going to take the square root of that, square root of the answer, and I get 3.5707. OK. Now I have uh, a normal model to deal with. OK. We're centered at 15, but I'm, what I want to have is I have, you know, just imagine a bar centered at 10, okay? And because it says at most 10, I want to include 10, okay? So if I'm shading this in, I want to include, I want to include 10 in there, okay? So my cutoff, oops. so my cutoff is going to be at 10.5. So I would say z is equal to 10.5 minus 15 over the standard deviation of 3.5707. Okay. So I have that already still in my calculator over here, so I'm just going to do 10.5 minus 15, close off the parentheses, and then divide by my answer right there. And I get negative 1.5. Two, six. Okay, so then I can go to my z table and look up uh, negative one point two six. So negative one point two six is right here, point one zero three eight. Okay, so we we'll go to here, look in the z table. Z equal to negative one point two six. We see the area to the left is equal to 0 0.1038, okay? And that is the area that I'm going for, 0 0.1038, so my answer is 0 0.1038. Is that good? <clears throat> is this uh, working out okay? The uh, non chalkboard I'm very comfortable with the chalkboard, but I'm, somebody complained in my reviews that I'm using like old-fashioned technology. Is your point that most of the time? Well, so I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna probably have to buy like a screen recorder software or something. That's it. Um, yeah, I'll figure something out. I'll figure something out. I'm trying to stay up to up to speed here, okay? Yes? Um, so I have a question in R. Is mm -hmm. there a way to do something in R, like um, in your calculator, where you can use the answer, like the previous answer? The previous, you know, I, <laughs> no. No? <laughs> you can hit the up arrow, okay? You can hit, hit the up arrow, uh -huh. and then, um, and then you can just store that into like a temp. Oh, okay. Okay. But there's no like A and S. Yeah, there's no A and S function. Or is there? I, I don't know. I mean, not that I'm aware of. Let's just see. Um, previous answer in R. Well, I don't know. There might be. Return value, last answer. R not last answer. Let's see. Anything similar in R? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, sorry. Um, yeah, not that I'm aware of. That's silly. It seems silly. Okay. Well, I guess uh, I guess when I s 
ask for a new uh, worksheet, I can sort of, uh, store um, these pages and then post them or something, uh, figure something out. Okay, so let me, um, any other questions regarding, from the quiz? Review. Okay, let's um, try a few exercises for review here. Then. Let's do, um, all right, so let's say there is a prize wheel, you win zero dollars, and you will win um, five dollars and one dollar here, okay? So if uh, if a casino wants to use this wheel, what should it charge the customers to break even? Charge customers to play to break even. So this is represents uh, maybe I should say this is one eighth, one eighth, one eighth, and three quarters, and uh, random spin. Okay, spins random. Okay, so I'm getting uh, a mean of 75 cents. Okay, so if they want to break even, they would charge 75 cents, and if they charge anything more than that, in the long run, they would be making a profit. Is that good? Okay, so charge 75 cents to break even. Charge more. Make profit.
in the long run. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, standard deviation of this. So the standard deviation, doing the same, 175, 1125, and 1125. So we found that the mean was 0.75. So the standard deviation, we would take minus, um, and we would multiply by the probability, because the uh, standard deviation by y minus mu squared times the probability of y. So we're going to do that for every every value in our probability uh, table. This would be sigma squared when, when I do that. 0.75 squared times 0.75. 1, 2, 1, 8, 1 minus 0.75 squared times 0.125. So we can see which which number contributes the most towards the uh, variance here, and adding all of these up, plus. Oh, I messed that up. Darn it! I don't know how to do this. Okay, so we'll do that plus. Two point six eight seven five, and then take the square root of that, and I get one point six three nine. That would be the same as using the equation the sum of y bar minus y square over m minus one square root. No, no. So, um, so what you're talking about. This is equal to the um, standard deviation of a sample. Okay. So this only works if you are given a list of numbers. Okay. So over here, this is a random variable situation. And what you are talking about is standard deviation of a sample. So that would be, you know, if I give you a listing. Uh, ages or something, and you have someone who's 5, someone who's 15, someone who's 36, someone who's 12, and somebody who's 45, and I ask what's the standard deviation of these, of these people, okay? So maybe these are ages of kids, in a, uh, of people in a family, all right? So the parents are 36 and 45, and then their children are, are this many years old. Um, then the standard deviation of these people's ages would be this standard deviation of sample y minus y bar squared over n minus 1. But that's different from what we did over here, where we are given um, the probabilities of each value.
other uh, questions or topics for review? All right, let me, uh, let me try making up a problem here. Okay, so let's say, um, I'll just try, try uh, okay, so we'll say, um, uh, Chris Paul, not Christ Paul, uh, Chris Paul um, is a basketball player, and uh, he, Chris Paul has a free throw shooting percentage of, let's say, 88%. Okay? Um, let's assume that the probability that he makes a free throw is independent of everything else. It's probably not the case, but let's just assume that. Okay, so if uh, Chris Paul CP3 takes um, 12 free throws in a game,